What are your top concerns with regard to side effects on the GLP-1 drugs? Mm. You know, I don't actually, let me think. I haven't sort of framed it in terms of side effects. Or top concerns my concern, then. Okay. Yeah, my, 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 I mean, I've listened to your talks on this and I've watched you disseminate some of the studies they put out and it has helped me steel man many different arguments. What are yeah. your top concerns? Yeah. Yeah, so it's uh, glucagon like peptide one, you know, <laughs> charmingly named uh, hormone that we have, that we endogenously produce. Right is prompted in us by signals from the body when we eat and from the brain that's, that basically it's a complex system <laughs> that has all of these inputs. This GLP-1 is produced when lots of things happen in the body and it produces feelings of fullness, of f physical feelings of fullness in the gut because it actually slows the passage of food to the gut right. and the psychological feelings of fullness so that we stop wanting to eat. Taking, putting that into the body whenever we feel like it, as opposed to when the food that we've eaten has prompted that, is likely to, A, decrease the endogenous production of GLP-1. So the, the drugs like Ozempic, which is usually what I just call the whole class of drugs, are what are called GLP-1 just the name of the enzyme, hormone, GLP-1 agonists. So they, they act in the same way as opposed to antagonists. They act in the same way as the GLP-1 itself. It's so a it's replica a, it's, of the hormone as well. It's a hormone mimic, basically. Got yeah. it. So Ozempic is basically a mimic of a naturally occurring hormone. Whenever you provide a hormone to a body that it could be producing endogenously or a neurotransmitter, but in this case it's a hormone, one of the things that happens is your body stops producing as much of the thing natively. So one of the things that's going to happen, I think for sure, is that you're either going to have to be on these drugs forever, forever or at the point you go off, your production of the endogenous hormone, GLP-1, is hopefully going to, with time, start ramping up again, but it's probably going to take a while, which means that as soon as you go off the thing, Gain it all back. you're going to have even bigger problems with controlling your food intake than you had before. Right. And so you're likely to gain a lot of the weight right back. More proximally, I think the idea of keeping food in your gut as opposed to processing it through the GI tract, like, I, like, I don't usually, I'm usually pretty, I usually keep the disgust response down to things. I've, you know, I've had a lot of weird experiences in life. Like you just, disgust is not usually the right response. This one prompts such a strong disgust response for me. Our GI tract is designed to have peristalsis throughout it, basically. We're, we're supposed to keep moving stuff through. Right. And in the stomach, we pull out what we need. We start digesting. We you know, move it into the intestines and, and then out it goes. The idea of keeping stuff there is likely to, A, pull out even more of the toxins in our toxic food supply from whatever you've eaten into the body. You're probably going to be toxifying yourself. You are going to, I suspect, have an increase in things like stomach cancers and other GI tract cancers because now you've got things just sitting there right. where they're supposed to be moving through. Right. And just in terms of like forgive me, but like the lived experience of being an active, healthy human being, when your gut is empty, you are like on fire. You're like, you are so capable. And it's, it's, it feels remarkable to have an empty gut regularly once right. a day, you know, once every couple of days, if, if that's the, if that's the periodicity you're on. But the idea of just always having food in your gut feels so gross and so unhealthy and so potentially toxic. You know, what What are the specific side effects? It's going to depend on what you ate. But oh given gosh, our food goodness. system, most people are not eating well. Most people who are choosing to be on Ozempic are probably not making the choices to eat, you know, organic, non-GMO, local, right. non-toxic food. Right. And therefore, that stuff that's now sitting in your GI tract is going to have even longer for your body to, to, to be absorbed into the rest of your body and then to be incorporated into, you know, hopefully just your fat, but probably also, you know, your bones, your soft tissue, your brain, all of it.
you know, I, I've talked to different people who are brave enough to speak out and whether I'm speaking to a gastroenterologist, one whose name I won't mention because she's actually asked me not to, has obviously talked about the fact that when food sits there, you run a greater risk of SIBO down the line, the small intestinal oh. bacterial overgrowth, because it's associated with a lack of gut motility. Could it, like the way you're suggesting, like when you look at the body as a complex system, when food is in there for such a long period of time, could it create disruptions in your gut microbiota? Dr. Hazen's actually looking at that. She's like, yes. you're not even going to believe what I'm coming up with or what I'm discovering. <laughs> I'll come on when the study is done. But I have Dr. Hazen's telling me about that. There was a study actually done where they looked at, I believe it was 100 individuals, and I, I might be wrong on how many people, but I think it was about 100 individuals that were going to get gastric bypass surgery and they put like something in their stomach to be able to see what was going on. And they found gastric bezoars in wow. like 23 people out of, I think like out of the hundred. And it's like this ball of undigested gunk. And this is people that are on Ozempic. The people that weren't on Ozempic, the, the other group, none had a gastric bezoar. And you mm. think like, I encourage everyone look look up a gastric bezoar. It will it will be quite gross. It will ruin your day. It will ruin your day. And you just think <laughs> yeah. nobody nobody is looking at these drugs and these medications the way you are. Of like, well, listen, if one plus one equals two, you know, maybe this will end up being the downstream consequence. But people are just kind of they're not even guessing. It's kind of like what you said of how long do we create the spike protein from the vaccine. Well, they only looked at a year, so we don't really know. Like, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, we, I mean, and of course, you know, the, the flip side of this, if I were to steel man this, Please. and I've heard this argument a lot, is, well, you can't expect us to do really long-term studies on every drug we want to bring to market because if they're actually life-saving or, you know, life-enhancing, then we want them available to people now, not in 40 years. That argument makes some sense, Okay. But if you can clearly put together the arguments against the thing now, then you should be listening to the arguments against. You can't just say, well, we aren't going to do any long-term studies because there's not time for them. Because we are already certain a priori before doing any work at all that this is safe. That sounds a lot like what was happening with the COVID vaccines. And that, you know, that's why I'm, this, this just feels so analogous. This feels like the same kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it's being pushed on people. You know, it's, it's different in that there's no mandates for Ozempic, right? But people are so excited about it. Oh, yeah. They're so thrilled. And oh, yeah. they Jabs look for at you. Jabs six-year-olds are trying to get approved. And they get angry with you if you say bad things about it, just like with the COVID vaccines. Yes. Yeah. 